Ladies and gentlemen, if you thought we couldn't top our guest to kick off today's sports report show, undefeated pro boxer Nicola the Hurricane Hopewell, who literally is the talk of the boxing world, well, I think we found a way to top that. And he's somebody that's become very important, not only to the sports report, but to Sportinarium. He is one of the most important interviews that we've ever done. And we like to refer to him as the heart and soul of knockout wrestling, otherwise known as KOW. And KOW has solidified itself as one of the premier wrestling companies, not just in the UK, but in the world with the who's who of wrestlers that they have and the who's who of wrestlers that have gone on to bigger and better things. And many of those wrestlers, obviously, we've had the honor and pleasure and privilege to be able to speak with here on the Sports Report over the past few months. And KOW right now has been looking back on its history. It's very important history in the top 10 matches of 2019. And we couldn't think of a better way than to celebrate the history of KOW and to look forward to the future of KOW and back by popular demand here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show. And that is the heart and soul of KOW. That's Booker, promoter, and the former general manager. Peace. My friend, welcome back. Hi Tom, thanks for having me back. I'm glad to be back. I'm very excited to be uh, talking KOW with you again. And actually, before we get started, I've got a little a little surprise for you. I thought, considering you always do these epic intros for people, and considering I used to be KOW's ring announcer, I thought, why don't we officially introduce Tom Brace as if you were competing or appearing on a KOW event? So if you don't mind, I've prepared a little ring introduction for you. Fire away, the floor is yours, my friend. Okay, here we go. I haven't done this in a while, so hopefully I'm not too rusty. Ladies and gentlemen, currently standing in the corner to my left is the challenger. He hails from the good old US of A. He has the best mutton chops in the game and the coolest shades. He is the host of the Sports Report on Sportinarium and KOW's favourite radio host, the Reverend Tom Bryce. Crowd goes wild. Applause. Applause. <laughs> I think, Mr. ALP, you could just take my job. I think I can retire now. I, I think I can retire now and I can do <laughs> the mic at this point because I don't think I can ever top that. So I think this is definitely a first. A few weeks ago, we had somebody that actually did a drawing of me and they actually signed the book for me. We uh-huh. have somebody that gives us music. But this, my friend, I don't think I can top. I mean, I seriously, we've had music being given to us on our behalf. We've had somebody draw me. But when it comes to this, Mr. ALP, like I said, the mic is yours. I mean, I think Sportinarium, I think Mr. Lakey would be more than happy for you to take over. So I I think at this point, I'm ready to retire. I can't top this. (laughs) (laughs) Don't say that. Who am I going to talk to about wrestling? (laughs) Well, I mean, I'm sure that there is somebody that would love to talk with you, actually. And that was somebody who came on the show last week. And that was the former KOW Tag Team Champion. And that is Mr. Andre Decker. And Mr. Andre Decker had a lot to say specifically when it came to the fact that he never got his rematch, apparently, when it came to him and his tag team partner as part of the underclass, Jackson Kelly, losing those tag team titles to Nightmare and Will Carter, who we're going to talk with I am sure quite a bit with you once again and he was also upset with the fact that he was only number 10 (laughs) as part of the KOW matches of 2019. So for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium, Mr. AOP, what do you have to say to Mr. Andre Decker on his many gripes? Ah, Mr. Decker. So, yeah, I can't say I was surprised by his comments. In fact, I almost saw them come in to some extent. In regards to his title rematch obviously the show what would have been our first show after they lost the tag titles didn't end up going ahead and another thing that again Mr. Deck should be aware of is we don't really have immediate rematch clauses in KOW that's not really a thing sometimes if a match ends you know via some sort of shenanigans or some sort of unfair actions somebody will get a title shot but generally I believe if you've lost the title you start from square one if 
you earn an opportunity again to challenge for them, that's fair enough. And Decker and Jax, I'm sure, despite their uh, heinous behaviour and the way they follow their the leader too, bit, I'm sure they will get another opportunity for the titles, but they lost the titles fair and square to Nightmare and Will Carter, who, I, as far as I'm concerned, were the better men on that night. And we are back up and running. They're more than welcome to prove that they deserve another shot. And if they prove that they are a shot, they will get a shot. And so that'd be my response to that. In regards to his feeling about the placement on the list, to be honest, I can respect that point of view. I think anyone who is on the list should want to be higher and should feel they should be higher. And if they don't, that's an issue in and of itself. So I'm not surprised that he felt should be higher. Certainly Royal Justice and the Underclass was a very good match. I feel their match with Carter and Nightmare could have also been on the list. But, you know, at the end of the day, he made it on the list. He was in the top 10 matches of the year. You know, he was in a very elite club. I think he should be happy with that. But at the same time, I can respect the drive and the determination to want to do better. And, you know, if he says that he's going to be the top of the list, then great. I look forward to seeing that. Like, say, uh, for Mr. Decker, if you are listening, you know how KOW works. Nobody gets handed opportunities. They're earned. So when you and Jax are back, when you're teaming together, the floor's yours, basically. Prove what you've got. Show that you deserve it. And then, yeah, then maybe you will be tag team champions again. And maybe you will be the top of the list the next time we have a top 10 matches of the year. <laughs> And something tells me that Mr. Decker is definitely listening, and he has plenty of time on his hands. So whenever KOW starts, I have a very good feeling that Mr. Decker will be in a KOW ring, and that very well might be his future home, and very well might be his only home in a professional wrestling ring. So we'll certainly, I'm sure, talk with Mr. Decker in the near and distant future about that, along with all the latest happenings in the world of KOW. It's a tremendous honor to have back on the show arguably the heart and soul of KOW and that is the former general manager and booker and promoter and even does some ring work and clearly at this point ladies and gentlemen I can die and go to heaven at this point because I have been introduced on the sports report somebody has done that and that is Mr. ALP who's backed by popular demand here and speaking about the top 10 here and I'll get into that here in a few minutes but for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarian what goes into picking a top 10 like this because I've had a chance to watch almost all of these matches by now ALP honestly all of these matches in almost any other company could have been the top match let alone being the top 10 I mean you really had a very difficult decision here and how to place these matches and who to put them where I mean talk about that process for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium one how did you go about picking the top 10 matches of KOW in 2019 yeah well obviously for putting matches together the responsibility fell to to uh, see our uh, official reporter at Cesaro Stan on Twitter. I have to get that in there. So she was the one who actually had to carry the weight of making that decision. But I think she did a really good job from what I can tell. And this is probably how I would have done it as well. Is she's, I think she's taken into account the historical significance of the matches as well as the actual in-ring action, the crowd reaction to it as well. Because some matches on here definitely are there because of historical significance. Not that they weren't good matches in ring as well. But some matches definitely had a lot more weight to them, historically speaking, than others did. And that is obviously something that's been factored in. I think that she's done a really good job. You know, she had probably around 25 to 30 matches to choose between. In terms of that, like say, personally, there's a couple of maybe slight differences I would have made, but that is just personal opinion. I think that every match she did pick deserved to be on the list. There's nothing that I would look at on this list and say, I know that shouldn't be in the top 10, but just maybe there's a couple of matches that could have been higher or lower, in my opinion, or, you know, maybe one or two other matches that I can think of that maybe I would put on the list. But that is why, you know, you want a list like this to be put together. There is no right answer. There's no wrong answer I and mean, of course she's given her personal opinion which is what we wanted because that's the thing she came into KOW as a fan and that's why I think it's cooler her to do it because obviously if I did the list it'd be through the lens of you know the booker and promoter and blah 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 whereas with Lucy's doing it it's as somebody who's coming to the show and even though she's involved in the company she's still watching as a fan she's still having genuine reactions to those matches as a fan so yeah I think she did a fantastic job with it you know I was very excited to get it she's done us a few different pieces including this match she also did us uh, predictions for uh, 2020 list which sadly obviously never went anywhere because of COVID but yeah I think she did a really good job she obviously she took it very seriously you know if you've been watching the matches being posted on our Facebook page we've included like her explanations for each match and why it's there and what she liked about it so definitely if you haven't go and have a look at them the original articles are still on the Facebook page as well so definitely go and give them a read but yeah I think she did a really good job and she did a good job of balancing like say the in-ring action the historical significance or the atmosphere the way the fans reacted to it as well and I think I 
think it's a very solid list. Other than, like, say, a couple of little changes that I would personally make that are just down to personal preference. I think she pretty much hit it on the head. And I want to give Lucy a huge shout-out because this is somebody... I mean, we call you the heart and soul, but this is somebody that literally put their heart and soul into this. This is somebody that took the time out and watched hours and hours worth of content and then was able to pick and choose on which matches were most important. And the fact that she watched 25 to 30 matches when I'm sure that at least five to seven of those matches, you could have said, you know what? I could have made a case for them that they could have been in the top 10 or I could have made a top 15. And I think that this is what makes Mm -hmm. KOW special and KOW unique versus other companies. And we did some work with a company about a month ago called Pro Wrestling Magic. And I'm not just saying this because you're on the air AOP and a number of the different KOW roster has been on the show here over the past few months. But I got to be honest, I watched a lot of these matches, obviously, and I've gotten to know what this company stands for. And Pro Wrestling Magic was on Fight TV this past weekend. And I got to be honest, you guys blew them out of the water. I looked at Pro Wrestling Magic versus KOW and, you know, no disrespect to anybody with that company, but it was almost like it was goofy. Mm-hmm. It was like independent wrestling that, I mean, it was laughable. They couldn't get the stream done right, and even the wrestling and the announcing. It just seemed like contrived at times. But with KOW, yeah. and Lucy's an example of this, of the professionalism, the quality of people, what you guys mean to Barrow. And I think Lucy is the hallmark and example of that. When I say those things about, let's say, Lucy, and I say about KOW, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it means a lot, obviously. I mean, I think that's always what we've taken great pride in. Is we know we're aware of our own limitations, and I think that's a big thing in wrestling as a whole for wrestlers, ring announcers, commentators, everyone. You have to be aware of what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. You know, we know what we can do and what we can't do or what would be too much for us to take on. You know, I mean, going back to talking about Lucy, the thing that's even more impressive about her is she doesn't have access to the footage. She doesn't have a video on demand service to watch. So when she writes up a show report, she's, you know, either making notes on the day of the show or doing it all from memory. When she went back to do the top 10 list, she had to go back and think about the matches over the past year. I mean, some of the matches were available online because, you know, Will Carter and 2Bit and people like that posting them, but a very small number. So she she, has to put a lot of work in and a lot of effort in to make sure, you know, obviously I cast a quick eye over them and quality check them, but pretty much she's always on the money and memory is pretty much always right. So I think that's even more impressive. When somebody's writing about a WWE show, you can boot up the network and just go and watch it. Whereas with (laughs) us, you know, she has to do it from memory. But yeah, I think we always know we know what we are. You know, we're not super frills. We don't have a lot of high tech. You know, we don't have big video screens or displays. We don't, apart from a couple of exceptions that we've made for like anniversaries and stuff, don't have like massively flashy entries and stuff. We are a very sort of, I guess you could say like sort of punk rock aesthetic kind of a company <laughs> where it is, you know, there isn't loads of money being thrown around, but there's little things like we've got the announcers table where Ethan would sit or I would sit previously. And at one point we were like, oh, if we put the title here, we can get just these little little lights and put them on. And then that looks cool from the crowd. Like the titles are little, like we'll do a lot of little things that will enhance things, but we're also aware that, yeah, we're not going to be like, let's try and stream the shows or let's try and do live commentary or, you know, record interviews backstage during the show and things because just we know what our limitations are and what we wouldn't wouldn't be able to do and what would be too much and then what would cause the show to suffer because at the end of the day, the thing that matters is the people in that venue and it's great being able to share this footage with people and be able to look at our matches and stuff, but that's not really why we record footage. We mainly record footage for us to go back and review for newer people who are working on shows to get feedback for people to be able to watch their matches back and tweet things. So some of this footage, like say, it's not like it was never meant to be seen by the public or anything like that, but it's not shot to be like, oh, we're going to make this into, you know, a weekly episodic show or anything like that. And it's just because lockdowns happened. We were like, well, we've got all this footage. People have got extra time on their hands. We've got somebody who's willing to spend the time to edit them and make the graphics. Thanks to those guys as well for doing that because they've done an amazing job with it. And so, yeah, I think that is a big part of it is like, say, because we've been doing it so long, we know what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. And because of that, we don't overstretch ourselves. We challenge ourselves. We do new things. We do things that we're not sure of but we still know where our our limits are and don't try not to push past those at risk then affecting the rest of the show and i think this is again kow it's everything there's just homegrown talent here you think about it lucy right you think about will carter's mother making the will carter buddies you think about two bits mother you think about lucas neon's mother working the shows you think about louis and what he meant to 
so many people. Even Sheriff Steele's match against Rick Marcus, where he retires, who's the first person that he acknowledges? He acknowledges Louis. I mean, you think about Cloud Nine in the Lounge, what that's meant. The people of Barrow, what you've meant, what Ethan's meant. The Academy, where so many wrestlers have come out of that Academy. And I think that this is what stands apart of KOW versus any other company out there is that you guys have really done it on your own. You guys have done things mm-hmm. that make you stand apart from almost any other company out there because you got the homegrown talent. You got the fans who have become something where you guys all got to know each other. Cloud9 in the Lounge, we just talked about. The Academy, we've talked about the families getting involved. And even watching these matches, and obviously we haven't had a chance to watch those matches or the majority of those matches in the past. And we'll watch them for the first time here on the Sports Report and on Sportinarium. And you could see that KOW, it actually meant more to me watching these matches than maybe talking with the different wrestlers that we've had or even you the first time. And when you were watching these matches versus when you were actually there in person, taking it all in, all these different matches, did you watch them differently or did you feel differently about these matches than when you did in 2019? Yeah, I think they definitely hit a lot differently watching them now. I think a large part of that is obviously because it's, it's been so long since we've been able to run a show. So as well as watching them back and being able to enjoy them again, it's also been, I don't, yeah, therapeutic, I guess is probably the right word to use with a lot of these. You know, a lot of them I was very, very excited to go back and watch because some of them I haven't seen since they happened live. And, you know, a lot of them I can remember the experience watching them at the time, but definitely now because, you know, the phrase absence makes the heart grow fonder and everything. I think that's definitely <laughs> been the case for everyone in KOW, you know, and it just sort of, my love for KOW has definitely not died, but it was a lot harder getting enthusiastic about things when we were in the middle of the lockdown. There was no indication of when things were going to open up again, you know, and it was that sort of, what's the point of starting to do KOW related stuff when we don't know what's happening? Because like, they, our main thing is the shows, you know, we don't have a video on man service, we don't produce a bunch of extra content like some other companies do. So it was the case of, well, if we're not running shows, that is the main thing we do so where's the motivation for that but yeah i mean some of the matches and we'll, we'll touch on this when we go through them in more detail but some of them like i was legitimately like i could feel the excitement again to watch them like i did on the night because at the end of the day i am still a fan of wrestling and some of the matches a lot of the matches on this list when i was obviously putting them together because obviously i'm the one who you know makes all the matches and everything some of these matches on this list i was legitimately like i am super excited to see this match as a fan like not even just to be like oh i think the fans are like this or everything. i was excited for them and a lot of them again i could feel anticipation hearing that crowd again was amazing and just remembering how into it they are and how passionate and excited they are about everything and how much support or hate depending on who it is they give to all the guys it was emotional i'm not gonna lie i shed tears more than once watching some of these matches back happy ones of course i should clarify but (laughs) yeah um it's been great yeah, I wasn't just weeping in, in, in sadness. But yeah, um, it's been great watching them back. It's been a proper trip down memory lane. Sort of reignited my fire for wanting to get back and to give everything once we are back and up and running again. And it's been fantastic. And we cannot wait to see you guys get back up and running. We're very excited about the future of KOW. And obviously, everybody can follow KOW on Twitter at KO underscore wrestling. That's at KO underscore wrestling. And find out for yourself why KOW is one of the premier wrestling promotions. As I am the host of the sports report the reverend tom bryce and we are talking with the heart and soul of kow that is booker promoter former general manager and also former ring announcer and that is alp the man who has done it all for this company there isn't anything that alp hasn't done for kow that's why we're honored to have him back on the sports report to talk about the top 10 matches of 2019 in kow we are going down memory lane here on sportinarium the number one global radio station and we're at sportinarium.com and of course you can catch the Sports Report from Friday to Sunday from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK Time on Sportinarium.com. And kicking things off for us, ALP, and we kind of alluded to it, obviously, in number 10 of the matches of 2019, and that was the Royal Justice versus the Underclass. And I think that this was where maybe we started to see the seeds a little bit. I mean, it wasn't there yet, but you could definitely see here the Royal Justice versus the Underclass kind of gave us the future of what we can expect down the pipe. But give us a brief synopsis and some of your 
memories of this match. Number 10, the top matches of 2019. That's the underclass versus the Royal Justice. Yeah, so this was wanted, which this was back at wanted, which was our first event of uh, 2019. Wanted, obviously, in respect to Sheriff Steele, who had just previously become KOW heavyweight champion. This match, I think, is one of the ones that is definitely a big part of it being on the list is because of its historical ramifications, as well as it being a, a really good tag team match. Because earlier in the night, Decker and Jax had actually joined with two bits to form the underclass. So this was the night that the underclass was first formed. And they actually interfered in two bits match with Lucas Neon to help him retain the showcase championship. So that's one reason why this is a really important match and just before the match as well after 358 days as being killed tag team champions the tag team titles were made official previously they had some uh, WWE kids replica belts that they'd customize <laughs> with the KOW logo and such um, because they wanted there to be a tag team division and there wasn't one so uh, Sheriff Steele had awarded them the title and they'd been going around defending them and at the time this is when I was uh, a bad guy and still the general manager and I'd made it very clear that these aren't official titles but if you want to put your own property on the line in a match I can't stop you from doing that but they're not officially sanctioned which is basically a dry run for me to see if we wanted to come to a tag team division and this was when Ethan was I think this was Ethan's first official night as general manager I want to say I might be wrong but I feel like it was or maybe it was after I yeah no sorry it was probably his first official night as general manager but yeah he made the titles official and then also awarded them the brand new tag team championships as well so that was really significant in that basically it led to an official KOW tag team division and the KOW tag team titles as well um, and during their reign you know Royal Justice had beaten the bench bros Andre Decker and Dave Birch in a previous match to bit Neon on. They'd be in a match, Hunter and Morellis, and also the Merseyside Mercenary Squad. So they'd been fighting champions and defended them a whole bunch. Of course, the newly formed in the class would accept the open challenge, which Royal Justice had laid out, which they did a lot during the title reign. They'd, you know, say to anyone, you know, a lot of those people, you know, the Merseyside Mercenary Squad, Dave Birch and Decker at the time were newcomers to KOW, who were sort of coming in to try and get themselves an opportunity. So, you know, like say they answered the open challenge with Two Bit watching on from ringside, who would end up being instrumental in the match. You know, Two Bit got involved throughout. He was swinging momentum in his team's face and stopping important tags from happening. He also stopped them from hitting their finishing move, King's Court Cutter, by grabbing Grayson's ankle while he was on the top rope setting up for that move and that allowed Decker and Dex to get momentum and ultimately win the match. And the underclass actually used their own finishing move on them to win the titles. Obviously, before this, they'd both competed as singles competitors but not really had much success competing on their own. Within the first night of joining up with 2-Bit, they pulled up a massive upset. You've obviously seen the footage, you know, some of the fans were devastated, some of the fans were crying, they were that upset that Royal Justice had lost their title um, and captured their first title gold, you know, and they've gone to have a very successful reign, you know, be champions for 260 days. And he, again, what makes this match and this even more important was later in the evening, Rick Marcus would attack Sheriff during the raffle with a steel chair and also attack Grayson with a steel chair as well. And then Taylor West would cash in his vertical briefcase and capture the heavyweight title for the second time. So Steele would lose his tag titles and his heavyweight title in one night and that would ultimately lead to him just disappearing, obviously just being heartbroken over losing all his gold in one night and having everything stripped away from him. Grayson didn't even know where he was and you know as we'll talk about later he was sort of pleading with the fans to let know if they heard from him and ultimately then from here Grayson would go on a, a vendetta against Rick Marcus. They'd have a false count anywhere match later in the year and then Sheriff would eventually make his return but we'll come back talking about that a little bit later. So yeah it was a good, it was a great match you know it was a great tag team match Royal Justice got to some of the traditional uh, hijinks in the ring as they were known for being quite light hide but also a very serious tag team. They'd have their fun but when business was business they'd get the job done the vast majority the time but yeah a huge match really fun a really interesting tag match obviously not a fun end for most of the fans and fans of Royal Justice but definitely one of the most important matches in the year because like say the underclass was formed it led to Sheriff ultimately vanishing Grayson and everything that happened with him you know it led to a lot of different things that happened in KOW throughout the year absolutely and you can see that the crowd did not like the underclass especially 2-Bit the Gangster Lord the King of Chavs the main event and the Underclass definitely were one of the memorable stables, not just of KOW, but of all of professional wrestling in 2019. They had pretty much a lot of gold, and we talk about Kenny Omega having a lot of gold, and we talk about the Young Bucks having gold. Well, it kind of reminded me a little bit of Two Bit the Underclass. So obviously, we could see that where this was going in 2019 in terms of KOW. And then speaking of Ryan Grayson, we see him once again in number nine for the top matches of 2019. And we also see a guy that we talked about a little bit, and 
he's come up on different interviews that we've done here on the Sports Report. That's Big Guns Joe and Mark Morellis. And talk about this match because this was another match that I got to be honest with you, ALP, if we just ended on this one, I could have made a case that this might have been a number one match because it was that good of a match. There was so many spots in the ring and it goes back to the versatility of what this company has to offer. So for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium, talk about match number nine of Top KOW matches of 2019. Yeah, so this was at the seventh anniversary show for the Vertigo Ladder match, which has now become a tradition on our anniversary shows. It's basically our version of Money in the Bank. So the winner obviously gets a briefcase, a title shot any time within the next year. So it's Matt Morellis, Big Joe, Ryan Hunter, Shawnee and Ryan Grayson. In terms of, you know, the compares, Morellis was looking for his first win in 2019. He was struggling to recapture his earlier glory. He was a heavyweight champion in the early days of KOW, but hasn't ever quite managed to recapture that success. But he's also got previous Vertigo Ladder match experience and has actually wrestled against Lucas Neon in a ladder match the year prior where Neon's contract was on the line. This was only Big Joe's second appearance of the year and actually wrestled twice and made it in the top 10 twice. So I think that says a lot about how good of a compare he is and what a great job he did. And this was his first ever singles match for the company. First time competing in the Vertigo ladder match as well. Many people saw him as the dark horse, but in this match, he was definitely a start making formance for him in KOW. He'd appeared once, as far as I mentioned, he was one half of the bench bros. So he'd wrestled Royal Justice for the tag titles in 2018. And then um, obviously had the match that we'll talk about later, where he teamed with Isaiah Quinn earlier in the year. But after the show, no word of a lie, pretty much everyone was talking about Big Joe, whether it be saying how much they hated him, how much they loved him. I know Lucy and her friends that she came through from the uh, Lancaster Uni Pro Wrestler Society were enamored by him and uh, completely obsessed with him after the show. So I think this was, this was really a big break. Him in, in terms of KOW. So yeah, but we'll come back to talk about him and his involvement in the match a little bit later on. And yeah, um, Hunter and Shawnee, some interesting notes there that after being at odds and wrestling each other early in the year, Hunter and Shawnee had recently formed a tag team, but due to issues outside of their control, there was a couple of times where they weren't able to make events, unfortunately. They hadn't been able to have a fair title shot. Hunter was going into his second vertical ladder match and hoping to catch some gold, obviously, because he is yet to win a title in KOW, and obviously that's something he wants to do. And But many people are before the show wondering well, what would happen if one of them won would use that as part of any farm team and maybe after the tag titles or would they be tempted to use it for themselves and go after the showcase or the heavyweight title and go for their own personal glory Shawnee has had a big transformation in um, 2019 going from Mr. Big who was his uh, Mr. Big Sean Vesey was his previous monitor which was a bit more uh, serious whereas now he's sort of a more fun loving tie dye wearing glow streak throwing wrestler um, <laughs> that we have today earlier in the year he'd actually taken on the underclass in a handicap match for the tag team titles and almost won that was on a occasion where Hunter was unable to appear sadly on the show so he decided to take them on and he, he did really well in fact if I remember correctly the underclass had to actually cheat to keep their titles so that shows you you know how much of a threat Sean he is even in this more fun loving persona that he has interesting fact or a couple of them at least he's also been in a vertigo ladder match in the past he actually competed in one of the third anniversary show in a match that also featured Pete Dunn in his one KOW appearance so he can say that he's uh, wrestled in a match with Pete Dunn which I'm sure is a cool little thing he can say <laughs> for many years to come um, and he is the only the only wrestler to appear at KOW's first ever show that's still active that's never won a title in KOW so coming up to nine years now and he's never won a title despite having one of the best win-loss records in the company I mean, he's had a couple of shots in the past he's just never been lucky enough and many fans you know are desperate for him to win a title so when we're back I'm sure that's going to be on his agenda I don't know if that's going to be him carrying on his team with Hunter and them going after the tag titles maybe but yeah like say Shawnee's always been a really well-loved wrestler and a very very solid compare and somebody who does really well but just for whatever reason has never quite managed to capture a title Grayson as well uh, King Ryan Grayson this is the first show after Sheriff Steele made his return but still Grayson and Steele hadn't actually shared the ring together since they'd, he'd been back and he was the favourite going into this match because he actually won the Virgo ladder match back at the third anniversary show and he also helped Steele to win it at the fifth anniversary show which only led to Steele being champion so he's had a lot of success in these matches um, as I mentioned he'd spent a lot of the year battling Rick Marcus after what Marcus had done a Royal Justice and barring the pair of them and costing Steele the uh, heavyweight title and yeah obviously things would take a turn later in the evening which again we'll come back to later as well in terms of the match itself like I say I think it's a perfect encapsulation of KOW and all its different aspects there was some serious wrestling some really painful stuff involved but a lot of it there was a lot of light hearted fun in this match which the crowd obviously loved I know I loved I was laughing throughout <laughs> this match with some of the stuff you know the calculating Morellis instantly getting out of the ring and arming himself with a ladder and waiting for his moment to get in Joe tried 
jump in from the ground to get the briefcase, which doesn't work. So he gets a boost from the other wrestlers, which doesn't go very well. He goes up to the mall and tells him he's bigger than the mall when in actuality he's smaller until he, of course, gets to Shawnee, who's a very big lad, and the acting gets underway. Joe gets barred around. An interesting note, Hunter and Grayson actually teamed for a short time during the match, which was a bit of a throwback to Hunter being almost the unofficial third member of Royal Justice, as he'd actually stepped in to defend the titles against the Merseyside Mercenary Squad when uh, Grayson was un- unable to make sure. So that was a nice little nod for the fans to that. They teamed up for a little bit. Oh, it didn't last very long. Insanely loud, tiny Joe chants from the crowd throughout, and they were super into the whole match. And I all hear those. <laughs> Obviously, you're a joke. Yeah, yeah, very, very loud. The, the <laughs> fans do love a good chant and they love getting somebody when they can. Obviously, there was the moment with the chicken fight where Morellis picked up Joe. Uh, Shawnee, I believe it was, picked up Hunter. Ethan then <laughs> goes under the ring and grabs Kendall sticks and arms both men and it prompts you chicken fight lightsaber battle in the middle of the ring, which wasn't <laughs> something I'd ever thought be ring. Oh, sorry, it was Grayson and Hunter actually. Yeah, I think uh, Sean is out of this match. Grayson ultimately low blows Mark. He drops to his knees and Joe and Grayson both end up with some uh, pain to the never regions because of that. Joe, again, being a very smart compare, as much as people sometimes don't take him seriously in the ring or seriously he should, working over Shawnee's leg with a ladder and a kendo stick, realising that if he takes out, you know, the wheels of the big man, he's going to be a lot less effective. Ravy Davy makes his appearance, for those who don't know. Again, previously, when Shawnee wasn't able to make a show, Ravy Davy had stepped in and uh, it's had some pain. I think we can acknowledge that. I think our fans are aware that it's had some pain. But dressed in, in sort of Shawnee cosplay with a lovely fake ginger beard and his own tie-dye shirt. So he runs out to try and take Shawnee's place. But quickly, Joe twangs his beard into his face. He t- he uh, takes big fall, rolls out the ring. Again, that was a really fun little moment that had everybody laughing as well. So that was great. And uh, Ravy Davy sort of become a, a third man for uh, Hunter and Shawnee lately. Joe as well tries to use the ring steps to springboard up, like jump off and springboard up to the case. He gets caught by Grayson and gets hit with a massive fall away slam. Towards the end of the match, Hunter hits a massive putter on Grayson while he's climbing the ladder. And ultimately, Grayson would climb up and wins the briefcase. Um, he was the favourite going into it. And often the times in, in KOW and in wrestling in general, the favourite doesn't always get it done but Grayson did the job gets the vertical briefcase for the second time which the fans were very happy with at the time and wouldn't be so happy about it later in the evening but again we'll come back to that but yeah really fun like I say some really cool hard hitting moments but also some of the more the more light hearted stuff that we're also known for some of the more comedic stuff but yeah it was a brilliant match thoroughly deserves its place on the list a bunch of guys who were all really good and used the time and the platform that they had um, and put on a really really entertaining match so yeah I remember being really really happy with it at the time and like I say Joe especially made a really big name for himself in KOW with that match and everyone was buzzing about him and his performance after the show. Absolutely and everybody involved in this match definitely needs a lot more buzz and Big Guns Joe is obviously a guy that has been talked about quite a bit in the pro wrestling scene since that match and also Ryan Grayson. I mean King Ryan Grayson definitely had a love-hate relationship to say the least with the KOW fans and Mark Morales was another guy also that did a lot in the company. I mean, listen, everybody in KOW has a place that one way or another that they've done something that is either going to make them loved or hate. But number eight, which you kind of just alluded to and going back to Big Guns Joe, and he was also a tag team partner with somebody that we've become very good friends with and we've become a big fan of his work. Although I don't know if the fans feel the same way as we do. And that's the Guiding Light Isaiah Quinn. An interesting tag team that was. And that was the Guiding Light Isaiah Quinn and Big Guns Joe. Joe against the team of the Freak Show. That was Nightmare and the unhinged Will Carter. I mean, a very interesting tag team, to say the least, when it comes to the Guiding Light, Isaiah Quinn and Big Guns Joe against the Freak Show. And so for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium, give us your memories of number eight of the top 10 catches of 2019. That's the Freak Show versus the Guiding Light, Isaiah Quinn and Big Guns Joe. So yeah, so this match took place after Shock and was actually a number one contenders match to decide who would get the next tag team title shots as the underclass were champions at the time. This was the night where Isaiah made his KOW debut like say to a team with Big Joe who was making his first return after appearing in 2018 like say it was an odd pairing you know you wouldn't naturally put these two guys together but they came together because they were you know obviously the hope was that if they won or 
or at least had a good showing that they may well get a spot on the KOW roster. Obviously, Joe has since come back and the plan is, you know, as long as everything works out, that he's going to be a full-time member of the roster. And I'm sure that Isaiah will make an appearance again at some point. But yeah, I think a lot of the time in wrestling, people do come together under strange circumstances, especially when there's opportunities and that sort of thing involved. So as strange as a parent as it was, they did work together quite well, as we'll talk about. And like say, they were, I think they were both putting any personal differences aside so that they try and get a big win and like say, open the door and then get themselves back on the shows. The Freak Show, you know, had obviously been friends for a long time. Nightmare was actually responsible for training Carter, but this was the debut out in as a team. Nightmare is a former two-time heavyweight champion. He's held the Virgo briefcase. He's won Road to Gold. Obviously, Will Carter was a former showcase champion at this point as well. And the KOW fans were very, very excited to see this pairing. I know there was a lot of buzz about it because most of the fans are aware, you know, they've had a close relationship even before they were formally teaming together. So everybody was very excited going into Aftershock about this match and the fact they were team together. And this match is the perfect representation of what KOW strives for. It's two of our own homegrown talent, the two, two of our best wrestlers that we have against two of the country's best. And that's what we're always trying to do. We want to take our best guys and pair them with some of the best guys in the country. And I think this is a perfect sort of summary. Definitely in the Northwest, Isaiah Quinn and Big Joe are two of the best going in 2019 and still now. Quinn and Joe jumped the free show start match, as you would expect. That they're both quite dastardly characters. But Kyle would use his speed and swing the match back in his favour. The free show show impressive tag team offense throughout you know it shows they've been preparing really hard for the match and they've obviously got really good chemistry after training together for numerous years you know and having each other's backs joe and quinn did a great job of isolating nightmare and keeping him grounded so he couldn't use his high flying offense like even though they were sort of a makeshift team they'd obviously got their strategy down and decided what they were going to do before going in both men obviously as well they've both got quite big mouths they both like speaking their mind and <laughs> repeatedly insulting the opponents and the crowd but not exactly winning themselves any favors from the fans but you know again you can't expect anything less from those two guys Quinn again very smart wrestling pulls Carter off the apron stop Nightmare from getting a big tag but after some you know signature unhinged offense and a couple of super kicks he manages to fight Isaiah off and get back to the apron the crowd were crazy behind Nightmare with massive Nightmare chants as he does make his way in the car and finally does get the tag builds a big house of fire lots of rapid kicks to Joe for tagging Nightmare in for some more tandem offense including using each other as a springboard sort of a whisper in the wind style sort of with the hardies that a little homage to that John Quinn hit a vicious heart attack as well which is a nice throwback for some of the more old school and die hard tag team wrestling fans. But ultimately, the makeshift team do suffer some miscommunications and that let Carter hit the big top rope double drop kick, which looked incredible. They got a lot high on it, it looked really impressive. And then it allowed them to hit their finisher and pick up a win. I yeah, know it was an awesome match. It was deservedly the highest rated tag match of the year. Quinn and Joe just couldn't overcome the freak show's superior chemistry and tandem offense. You know, a makeshift team in their first match together versus, like, say, two guys you've literally trained together and have done for probably seven years, six, seven years at this point are obviously going to have an advantage. Like said, this would obviously result in Joe going on to compete in the Virgo ladder match and getting a roster spot. And again, I'm sure Quinn will make an appearance at some point in the future as well when we're able to uh, arrange that and get that sorted. And yeah, as well, Freak Show would then go on to win the tag titles from the underclass at the anniversary show and are still their reigning champions, although their title reign is currently on hold and they will be defending their gold once again when we are back in action. But yeah, a really, really good match. You know, I remember loving it at the time, being really, really happy with how it went. The fans loved it. They loved seeing the Freak Show come together. Quinn and Joe did a great job being the despised bad guys and they weren't walk over or push over by any means despite being a brand new team. So yeah, a really good match and like say, I think it's a perfect example of like say what we aim for which is like say the best homegrown talent and the best in the Northwest and the UK as a whole has to offer competing against one another. Absolutely. And the guy in light Isaiah Quinn I continue to say this each and every week on the Sports Report really knows how to work a crowd and he really can get under the skin of a crowd and there was no better example of that here in Barrow with Cloud9 in the lounge and the fans just love Will Carter and they just love Nightmare I mean, in my head and I keep continue to say this each and every week ALP I continue to hear those kata 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 I continue to hear those Carter chants I know that we were talking about this with Will Carter when he came on the show last month I mean those chants I mean they're still in my head it's his chance it's Sheriff Steele's chance it's I mean there's a few wrestlers that they just have this unique captivation with the crowd and there's no question that Will Carter has that and then speaking of Nightmare and this might have been the match that I think solidified 2-Bit there's a lot of matches that you could say that have solidified 2-Bit in his place not only in KOW but in professional wrestling and that was the opening round to the Road to Gold tournament and that's number 7 here of top 10 KOW matches of 2019 that's 2-Bit versus Nightmare and talk about that match for our worldwide audience listening here on 
ordinarily. Kind of the match that, again, put 2-Bit on to the road, no pun intended, to where he is today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, it was an impromptu match because Grayson wasn't able to compete on the show, unfortunately. So we had to, as does sometimes happen with wrestling shows, we had to have a bit of a shuffle around on the day of, which is always stressful and, and fun for me to deal with. But as far as I know, it was the first time they had, and they wrestled a match on a main show. They may have collided on an academy show in the, in the past. Obviously, as I mentioned before, those are only 20 or 30 people. So in, in terms of the majority of the KW fans, they'd never seen this matches before. And many fans and people in the company were very excited to see the match. I was incredibly excited about it. This was one of the matches that I had in my back pocket for a while. I was like, oh, at some point, we can do two bit of Nightmare and that match will be sick. So I was very much looking forward to this match as well. Like I said, as a fan, I was like, this is going to be great. And it didn't let us down at all. Two bit was just coming off his loss of the Showcase Championship to Neon in their incredible TLC match, which we'll talk about later. And at this point, he was actually refocusing on trying to win the tournament and going after the Heavyweight Championship. As I mentioned, Nightmare is a former tournament winner. He won Road to Gold 4 in probably one of the most memorable tournament finals I've ever had. And also a two-time Heavyweight Champion as well. He's obviously recently formed the Freak Show. And he is actually, at this time, they are the number one contenders for the Tag Team Championships. But at this point, obviously, he was going to be in the tournament. Will Carter had a Heavyweight Championship match later in the night. So there was a potential that it could have been Carter a Nightmare for the Heavyweight title at the anniversary show, which would have been very interesting. Obviously, that didn't come to pass, but that could have happened. And so if Nightmare had won the tournament, there was a chance he could have gone on to be a dual champion, being only the third person to do it after Rick Marcus and Sheriff Steele, I should mention, because I've not mentioned that. I'm sure they'll uh, have a go at me for it later. So it's obviously, two bits obviously accompanied by the underclass, whereas Nightmare is competing alone, which is actually because, like I mentioned, Carter was of his first one-on-one match for the heavyweight title later that night. And Nightmare had specifically, uh, by my understanding, had had a conversation with Will and told him not to accompany him, and they wanted Will to focus on his match. So just an example of Nightmare being a great teammate would ultimately cost him in the end, but I think it was the right call to make so that Will could focus on being ready for his match. So to start the match, a bit, two bit was attempting to ground Nightmare with technical wrestling, which again is very smart because Nightmare's high flying, but he used his experience advantage to wrestle at his own pace and get the upper hand. You can see straight away how smooth these two guys are in the ring together, how quickly strange hold, two bit quickly scarpers to Decker and Jake Jacks on the outside when he loses the momentum, and then a distraction from Decker allows two bit to seize control again. Nightmare goes for a monkey flip, but two bit reverses it into a really nice pin. The action's fast and furious as both men are flying all over the ring. Jacks this time provides a distraction. So once again, allow 2-Bit to take control. As you can probably tell with the underclass already, they love using distractionary tactics and anything they can do to get the upper hand. Again, Decker later in the match grabs Nightmare's leg. So once again, they'll either the advantage. And every time Nightmare's building momentum, the underclass are there to cut him off. 2-Bit's working over Nightmare's head and neck to soften him up for the sleeper, which he loves to use, and distract the ref as again to allow the underclass to get cheap shots in on the outside. But despite the constant interference, Nightmare, which is one of the reasons fans love him, just won't stay down and keeps fighting back. You know, every time he loses the momentum he battles to get it back again. Two bit gets frustrated that he can't get the pin after a superplex, followed up with another suplex in the ring. And one of two bits one of his few weaknesses is that sometimes he does let the crowd get to him. And this was the moment where he <laughs> did lose focus on nightmare and it allows him to recover. And he hits a massive emerald flosion or the white noise if you're a shameless fan. And then the sling blade goes for a massive swanton but misses it. And then two bit takes control again, locks in the sleeper, jumps on nightmare's back to increase the pressure. Nightmare manages to recover though and hits the headlock driver, which is his finishing move. But but the underclass are there once again as Jax pulls the ref out of the ring. The ref's about to throw them out of the match, but Nightmare hits a massive top here to the outside onto them to a massive reaction from the fans. Fans were very happy to see Decker and Jax finally get a bit of comeuppance after being involved in the whole match. But ultimately, this would lead to the referee being distracted. Two bit reverses another headlock driver attempts into a pin, puts his feet on the ropes, which the ref misses and gets the pinfall. So the underclass steal a win for one of KOW's best, and two bit progresses to the final. I think, like you said, this was the match that saw of showed that two bit could hang on the higher level of KW wrestlers. Not saying that competing for the showcase championship or any of the guys that you wrestle for that are top tier talent, but when you're going from a Will Carter or a Lucas Neon to a nightmare, that's a big step up. You know, he's got that extra experience. He's a true mainstay in the company. And even if it was with a lot of shenanigans and with a lot of tomfoolery and unfair behavior, it'd still get the win and it did show that he could definitely hang with somebody of nightmare's ability. And then later on the night, and uh, knowing that the freak show are the next challengers after Will 
Okada did challenge for the heavyweight title, the underclass Decker specifically, which actually smash a glass ball over Nightmare's head on the stage and try and take him out ahead of the anniversary show. So again, just to give some sort of more general context of what was going on at the time. But yeah, so this would all feed into everything that was going on. But yeah, really, really good match. Like say, it was sort of a last minute addition to the card, but all the fans were super excited for it as soon as they found out it was happening. Like I said, I was very excited to watch it and it, it definitely lived up to all my expectations. You know, it, it could have been higher or lower on this depending on people's personal opinions. But yeah, a really good match. Like say, sort of two bits first match, like say after losing the showcase title and sort of really establishing himself as a potential threat to the heavyweight title as well. Absolutely. And you kind of felt like in a lot of ways, this was the coming out party for 2-Bit because even though 2-Bit had had wins in his career that were substantial, I kind of felt that this was the win that put him, like you said, in that direction where he could be in the ring with a Rick Marcus. He could be in the ring with the Sheriff Steel because a win over Nightmare, I mean, Nightmare is a linchpin of the company. He's a multiple time world champion. He's a tag team champion. He's been a main eventer. And in a lot of ways, he's been the cornerstone of KOW, similar to a Sheriff Steel. And speaking of other cornerstones in KOW, it leads us to number six of the top 10 matches here of KOW in 2019. That's the War Machine, Craig Collins, because he was another guy that in watching him a couple of different times here on our list, that the fans were behind him. He had sort of that workman, underdog, but blue collar could hang with anybody. And he was a big part of KOW, obviously, and being a world champion and having all the success that he's had. And also, we see Ryan Grayson once again. I mean, between two men and Ryan Grayson, I think I'm going to lose count on how many times I've mentioned them or have seen them on lists right now when it comes to KOW. But talk about number six on the top 10 KOW matches of 2019. That was a wild, to say the least, fatal four-way match between the War Machine, Craig Collins, Turbo Josh Terry. I am tongue-twisted saying his name because he literally <laughs> makes you tongue-twisted in the ring. Callum Corey and King Ryan Grayson. So for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium, talk about number six for us, the top 10 KOW matches of 2019, the fatal four-way between the War Machine, Craig Collins, Turbo Josh Terry, Callum Corey, and King Ryan Grayson. Yeah, so this was a four-way eliminator match, which are a four-way and so that style of match where it's elimination rules. I think one of the things we do quite well is multi-man matches um, and they're usually quite chaotic and fun. I've, if I remember correctly, Lucy specifically mentioned that in this match when she wrote up the entry for it as the number six match. Again, another good example of our own local talent against some of the best in the country. Grayson, this was a payback, so this was the first show after Wanted and everything that had happened there. So Grayson wanted to face Rick Marcus, obviously, but Marcus was suspended by Ethan Edwards because of his actions at the previous event, meaning that the King had to instead focus on taking on these three incredibly talented wrestlers instead. And Grayson actually asked Edwards before the match why he'd done that and why he suspended them. And ultimately, Ethan agreed that the following event that they would have, he would get his match with Marcus. Josh Terry, this was only his third appearance in the company, but he'd already massively impressed KOW fans and management. Pulled off a big victory on the show over Rick Marcus, who was a former KOW heavyweight and showcase champion. So that was a really big win for him. And even in his first match, which was a losing effort, he'd, you know, he'd put on an incredible performance, really shown off his athleticism and how good of a compare he really is. And it's no wonder that, you know, he's working with WWE a lot now. And obviously a win here would continue his upper trajectory and maybe put him in line for a title shot. Craig Collins was actually coming off a couple of big losses. He'd failed to beat West in their rematch for the Vertigo briefcase. And then in another match we'll touch on later, he hadn't recaptured the heavyweight title in that triple threat match, which we'll talk about later either. But he had promised that he was going to win the belt by the end of the year. And obviously in this match, he needed to pull off a big win to prove that he still deserved a show the company's round as prize. And another note, it was actually Craig Collins' birthday as well on the day of this show. Yeah, just to touch on Craig a bit, because I don't think we talked about him much originally when we did the original interview. And I think, you know, he's somebody we, we need to talk about more. But yeah, like you say, you know, Craig is a very no-nonsense compare. He'll never back down from a fight. He is an absolute beast. Like, he's so powerful. I've always said that if somebody was chasing down, you know, like down a dark alley or something, Craig Collins is the last person in the world I would want chasing me. <laughs> he's an absolute beast. He's, he's got cardio for days. He's strong as hell. And when he wants to be, he can be the most scary and intimidated dude going. Also, one of the most underrated and underappreciated wrestlers in the Northwest. He should be everywhere. Obviously, very happy to have him in KOW. And he's one of the biggest stars and one of the most reliable people we have. But definitely, he's somebody who should be wrestling everywhere. And hopefully, when things open up again, you know, he'll get more opportunities and that sort of thing. Because I'd love to see that. Because he definitely deserves it. After all the hard work he's put in over the years. Callum Corey, like I said, it was Craig Collins' birthday. So, Ethan led the crowd in happy birthday to you, which was a very nice little moment. 
moment, but Callum Green erupted that and got on the microphone. This was his first appearance. Obviously, he wanted to make a big impression and made himself unpopular with everyone in the room, insulting everyone before only being laid out by Collins. Obviously, like I say, it was his KOW debut, but he'd competed for multiple companies throughout the Northwest, and so he'd caught the attention of KOW management, and obviously, again, much like with Isaiah Quinn and Big Joe that we discussed earlier, obviously, when people do come in, a big win can lead to people getting a spot on the roster, which obviously, you know, people want to be part of the shows, and people want to be used regularly if they can be. Collins early on showing off his impressive power, like say, the guy's an absolute beast, and Terry's incredible athleticism as well, with some really, really cool high-flying moves, and it would actually serve as a precursor, because they would actually face off in the first round of the Road to Gold later that year, which was also a very good match, and could have been argued, could have been in the top ten as well. Uh, a very funny moment where um, Collins was doing his signature clotheslines to opponents in the corner, where he runs back and forth. Grayson gets in on the act, but his cardio's not great, and he gets tired out <laughs> midway through, which got a, which got a, a nice chuckle from the fans. Collins and Terry both do headstands in the corner, and Corey joins in as well after being encouraged by Grayson. So there's three of them in each corners, all doing headstands upside down, which again was another fun little moment. Grayson being smart knows that if he walks over, he's probably going to get booted in the face. Gets out over on the top rope, knocks Corey down, and they have a little confrontation. Rick Marks' music starts playing, so everybody's attention is turned to the entrance where, because obviously he was suspended, he wasn't meant to be there, so I thought he was going to show up and come after Grayson, but he wasn't there, and that allows Corey to take advantage. Terry then hits a, a gorgeous shooting star press off the top rope, and that eliminates King Ryan Grayson, which just add more fuel to Grayson and Rick Marks' issues. Corey then immediately again takes advantage and rolls up Terry with his feet on the ropes. It's down to Collins and Corey for the final two. Collins hits a couple of his huge signature belly-belly suplexes, and the crowd are really behind the birthday boy. Corey hits a massive double stomp to Collins as he's draped across the middle rope, which looked brutal. Corey goes under the ring and pulls out an extension car, which he tries to use as a weapon, but he's stopped by the referee. Collins hits another big belly-to-belly, uh, hits the nip up and his signature cannonball into the corner, and then a beautiful frog splash to pick the win. Again, back on the right track after a couple of big losses, and then he reiterates his intent to be KOW champion by the end of the year and tells West that he better be ready for war. So yeah, a really fun match, like say, uh, a lot of the time our sort of four ways on my man matches are a lot of fun, a lot of chaotic action, you know, some phenomenal talent in this match, you know. Callum, again, we haven't had the opportunity to have him up again, but he did an amazing job. Josh Terry, of course, is phenomenal. Uh, my only concern is going to be if we're going to be able to use him when we're back again, just because, like say, he's been working with WWE a lot lately. Uh, obviously, Grayson and Craig Collins as well, both phenomenal. So yeah, a really good match, a really good example of sort of our, our more chaotic and, and wild multi man matches it definitely deserved a place on the list and was as was a really fun time absolutely and then very quickly here as we now run down the second half of the top 10 kow matches in 2019 as we're getting down to the nitty-gritty here into stretch time here very quickly triple threat sees us once again when it comes to nightmare the war machine craig collins the aforementioned war machine craig collins and then our world champion taylor west the thug life i mean he's another one that we haven't got a chance to talk about but he's very memorable in the ring he's got a very memorable catchphrase and you could definitely see why he was the world champion so for our worldwide audience listening here on sportinarium talk about number five here the top 10 kw matches of 2019 that's for the world championship here and that is taylor west the war machine craig collins and our old friend nightmare yeah so this match was amazing like i mentioned earlier that maybe if i'd done the list personally i could I might have changed a couple of things and this is a match that I feel like could have very easily been higher on the list I thought it was phenomenal and we'll get into it a little bit more shortly but yeah so Taylor this was a wanted the main event of wanted this was the same night that Taylor West had cashed in his briefcase on steel to become champion for the second time his plan was actually just to head home and celebrate with a few beers and whiskeys as he has known to do because he I'd say he's, he's from the west side and he, he likes to he likes to party he does Taylor West when he can but Ethan Edwards called him in no uncertain terms he's gonna have to defend the title and instead of him going going home and partying and celebrating his title victory. He would be facing the Sheriff's originally scheduled opponent, which was going to be Nightmare in the main event, which obviously infuriated West. West has a very short fuse. He's a very angry person, which has helped him and hindered him multiple times over the years. Nightmare had previously been granted a one-on-one rematch by Sheriff Steele after KOW's resident lawman ended the mass sensation's previous title reign at the uh, sixth anniversary show. Nightmare had actually been champion for 364 days. He was one day short of holding the title for a year, and he would have only been the 
second person to do that after Chris Ridgeway. He had 11 successful title defenses during that time, which is actually a KOW record. He defended the title more than anybody else ever had, but obviously, when West cashed in his vertical briefcase, plans had to change. West and Nightmare have a storied history that goes back to our very, very first show. They actually competed in the very first KOW Heavyweight Championship match back at Proving Grounds was our first show. I should know the name, right? Pretty sure it's Proving Grounds. I hope I'm right. Oh, well, again, I'm going to get slated. I'm pretty sure Proving Grounds was our first show. Um, again, like we mentioned, this was Collins was just coming off a loss to West in the Vertigo Ladder match after West had taken advantage of a knee injury. And that was actually the second match in West and Collins' trilogy of matches, which stretched over the 5th, 6th, and 7th anniversary shows. And Collins was actually a last-minute addition to the match, being inserted by Ethan Edwards to spice up his first main event in charge. And obviously the fans loved that. If you've seen the match, you can hear how excited they are as soon as they hear Greg's music and realise what match it is that they're getting. Because because again, these three are three of the cornerstones of the entire company. As far as I'm concerned, these three guys in this match are KOW. They're from the very first show. Taylor Wolves was the first heavyweight champion. He was the leader of the triad. He was aligned with me for a time. He came back and was champion again at this point. Collins is a former heavyweight champion. He's the current heavyweight champion. He's won Road to Goal, Nightmares. They've all done so much in the company. And without any of these three guys, KOW would not be the same thing. So watching this back to me... This was one of the matches that I had a real emotional reaction to because in terms of the history of KOW, seeing those three guys together in the ring is a very big deal. And so, you know, I really felt that, especially with the absence of KOW shows in such a long time. So, yeah, I was really, really excited to see to watch this match back because when it was live, it was insane. So I was really looking forward to watching it. A bunch of reversals and counters to start out. You know, it just shows how well these three men know each other. They've all wrestled each other numerous times, teamed together, all that sort of stuff. Early on, tits of monkey flip from Collins and I Nightmare, uh, who turns into a head scissors takedown on West, which was an incredible little manoeuvre. Collins and Nightmare lock up and exchange various manoeuvres and near fall attempts. What's cool about these sorts of matches is Collins and Nightmare, you wouldn't usually see square off. They're usually on the same side, if anything, so that was really cool to see. Nightmare hits a hurricane runner, and Nightmare and then Collins then does a headstand in the corner, which is one of his little signature moves, but again, because Nightmare knows him so well, he avoids the kick. Later on, West drags Nightmare from the ring and throws him into the wall and squares up to Collins. Obviously, this is a mean immediately after they've had that third goal ladder match after the year before they had a street fight so the fans are fully aware of the rivalry after these two hate each other so you can feel the anticipation building in the room the two from me he punches forearms and clotheslines each other beating the absolute hell out of each other Collins ultimately gets the upper hand but then the champ hits a massive sidewalk slam to regain advantage Collins hits a couple of belly belly suplexes and a vertical suplex with sneeze being on the mat so again showing what absolute beast Collins is the fact that he managed to lift West over for his head West is not a small guy and like say not even from a standing position West was on his knees so he had to lift him from even lower so that was incredible watching that back I was like ah Collins is a beast <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was cool <laughs> I was legitimately like going, ah, like yelling at my laptop screen about it. He hits the cannonball and then a gorgeous frog splash, but West manages to kick out. Nightmare gets back in and in, hits a big Inzagiri on West and then also immediately hits the bulldog on Collins. I guess Nia falls on both men. Collins manages to reverse the headlock driver and hits a couple of Germans on Nightmare. Paul West grabs Collins and Germans both of them, which was another oh my god moment where, like say, West suplexes both men, which was insane. Gets a really good reaction from the crowd deservedly. Nightmares then later set up on the top row. West grabs him and basically throws him into an involuntary swamp tom bomb on the Collins. Nightmare later on heads back up top, hits the panic attack on West, but then immediately gets frog splash from Collins who flies in from the other corner, which again was insane. Some really, really awesome spots and moves in this match. Nightmare uses Collins as a springboard but gets caught by West and powerbombed back on the Collins. Like I say, there's so many cool moments in this match. Nightmare hits top as well. Again, Again, Nightmare's going up top trying to use his high flying a lot in this match with the two more powerhouse sort of bruiser style wrestlers he gets caught off by Collins who sets up to hit a superplex but then West grabs him and then power bombs them both off the top which gets again an insane reaction and ultimately West ends up paying a Death Valley driver on Nightmare to pick up the win an incredible match in my opinion probably the best triple threat match just in terms of in-ring action in company history I can't think of another triple threat match that was better than this so it was phenomenal some really really cool moves and exchanges between them be clearly 
they all know each other so well. They're all so comfortable and smooth in the ring with each other. It was a deserving main event. And even though it was an impromptu match that people weren't expecting, I think, again, because of how well established all these guys are, as soon as the fans realized what the match was and they were like, okay, we're getting this match. Everyone was super into it. Actually, again, an interesting note, Lucy actually posted a clip, a video clip of the Tower of Doom in the corner um, on Twitter and said the match wouldn't have looked out of place on Raw, which was a very nice thing to say, which ultimately led to her being KOW's official reporter because that was how she first came to our attention and later on she reached out and explained she did some writing and stuff and that's how she ultimately became KOW's official reporter so I just wanted to mention that as well because that was basically how she got started. This was her first ever show that she came to and yeah, like such a good match, honestly really, really good. One of my favourites to watch back, like say, just because of the three guys involved, you know, what they all mean to the company, like say, to me, like say you know, if you had to have a Mount Rushmore and there was only four people you could put on it, those three would be on it and then it would be a question of who gets the fourth spot but yeah such a good match really really good yeah I absolutely loved watching it back in like say it was, it was an emotional experience for me watching it back just because like say it's sort of this was the match that really hits home as being like say that like this is KOW you know these three guys are you know you've said obviously you know you've referred to me as the heart and soul killer, which is very flattering it's very nice to hear <laughs> but I'd argue that these three guys in terms of wrestlers would all definitely deserve that title as well um, so yeah this one was, was a pleasure to watch back and enjoy and I'm sure I'll go back to it again in future and watch it again and enjoy it just as much as I did when I watched it live and just as much as I did when I watched it back for uh, the purposes of this interview. And ladies and gentlemen everybody should go back and watch all of these great matches that KOW has to offer and you can follow KOW on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and these are the reasons why we're honored to have back on the Sports Report the number one global sports show that is the heart and soul. At least from us we consider him the heart and soul of KOW that is Mr. ALP, the legendary ALP here. As we have a few more minutes here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show here on Sportinarium talking all things related to KOW. And it's always an honor to have ALP back on and talk all the great things about the company. And for time purposes, ALP, 2-Bit Will Carter. I feel like we've talked about them over and over and over. We got to talk with both of them on match number four. And I want to go then to match number three very quickly because I want to get down and, and get down mm-hmm. to the nitty gritty here. Number three here. This was a match that was another interesting one. And we see two bit yet again. I almost feel like we could call KOW the two bit show at this point because I think I've mentioned his name more times than any other name, your name included. <laughs> that was the triple threat match of the Road to Gold Six final. And then that was the War Machine Craig Collins, our very good friend, our dear friend, the Cumbrian outlaw Rick Marcus and the gangster Lord Two Bit. A very interesting matchup here. And for our worldwide audience, very very quickly, give us a quick synopsis on this triple threat match, which was match three of the top 10 KOW matches of 2019. Yeah, so going into the final, um, Craig Collins had been injured by uh, Taylor West. So he came in the match with an injured ankle. He wasn't actually cleared to compete and had to agree that if he did, the company wasn't going to be held liable. Obviously, two and Marcus, both of them being the despicable guys that they are, took full advantage of that. You know, they had an impromptu alliance and that did fall apart. Collins, though, like say, so much gut, so much determination, wasn't going to be kept down and kept fighting back. He only did manage to eliminate two bit with the cross face, which got a great reaction and left it to him and Marcus. Marcus again resulted to using nefarious tactics because he wasn't able to put Collins away, went to get a steel chair, the ref tried to stop him and he got knocked down and then Marcus went to town on Craig, hitting him with multiple chair shots and this was the moment that all the fans have been waiting for. Sheriff Steele returned, his music played, he ran into the ring, beat the absolute hell out of Marcus, the chair shots that he was hitting on Rick, literally a year of pent-up frustration. You could tell Marcus was feeling it. Sheriff beat him black and blue with that steel chair. Got his revenge, left it to Collins and watched on from the stage. Collins was able to use that, you know, now that the, the odds had been evened and made fair again. You know, he managed to fight back. He hit his massive frog splash again, which is always gorgeous whenever he hits it. Marcus managed to kick out of that, but again, he got him in the cross face as all the fans chanted him a tap. This was the first match in the list that when I was making my notes, I actually started typing stuff in caps locks because I was getting that worked <laughs> up watching the matches. I was like, ah and typing things in caps locks but yeah so yeah uh, he's locked into the cross face fans chanting at him incredibly loudly to tap out Marcus taps Collins gets a massive upset victory fulfills his promise that he's going to go on and wrestle Taylor West now for the heavyweight championship in the main event of this 7th anniversary show the biggest show of the year you know they're going to finish off their trilogy of matches tied at one apiece Sheriff Steele's back he's got his revenge on Rick Marcus and obviously that would then lead to the next match we're going to talk about which would be Sheriff Steele versus Rick Marcus Sheriff's Rules match where the 
must retire. So yeah, this match again is a really good match, but again, I think this is a match that is also there because of its historical significance. Obviously, so much craziness and carnage going on, Collins' injury, Sheriff Steele returning as well. So this was a really big triumphant moment, a real feel-good moment for the company. Everybody was overjoyed to see Sheriff back and overjoyed to see Craig overcome the odds to win and go on to face West. So yeah, a really, really good match. One of the best Road to Gold finals, I'd say. The Road to Gold finals are always pretty damn good and pretty dramatic, but this one is definitely up there in terms of some of the best ones we've ever had and definitely one of the most dramatic ones we've ever had. Oh, absolutely. No question about it. And again, like I said before about the war machine, Craig Collins, he's just one of these underdog blue collar wrestlers that you really just want to get behind in between him and Sheriff Steel. I mean, it's almost like the Mega Powers and or Rock and Austin on just <clears throat> how beloved they are. I mean, obviously that would have been an interesting pairing instead of uh, King Ryan Grayson and Sheriff Steel, which obviously leads us into number two and that was the Sheriff Rules retirement match between the Cumbrian outlaw Rick Marcus and Sheriff Steele. I mean, these two, I mean, this very well might have been the biggest feud in KOW history. And watching this match, and very quickly talk about this for our world in audience, because watching this match, I think, was the hallmark of the kind of wrestlers that the Cumbrian outlaw Rick Marcus is and Sheriff Steele was because, I mean, this was one of the matches when it comes to KOW where I think you got to see a little bit of everything. I mean, the outside brawling and the different spots in the match. I mean, there was just, I think, something for everything. And this was one of those matches where the KOW crowd, I think, was literally a part of the match and some. And talk about this match because it almost had sort of like a Bret Hart, Stone Cold Steve Austin vibe and flair to it. So talk about number two here very quickly in the Cumbrian Outlaw, Rick Marcus versus Sheriff Steele in the Sheriff Rules retirement match. Yeah, so like you say, you know, this was the culmination of a three odd year rivalry between the two. I think what made the rivalry so good is that they are a lot more similar than you'd initially realised. They both came from the academy. They were both dual champions at different points. You know, they both worked really hard, but they just have completely different ethoses when it comes to being wrestlers and how they carry themselves. You know, they previously fought in Sheriff Rules match at the fourth anniversary show, so Sheriff had won. And obviously, like we explained last time, Rick went on his quest to become champion. Steele would cash in his Virgo briefcase after one road to gold, and then Steele won the title, and that's what led to Marcus attacking him with the steel chair and ultimately cost him the title. So at this point, you know, they've had they've had battles before. The hatred could not be any stronger. In Marcus's mind, Steele cost him the title, but he cost Steele the title. Steele comes back and costs him road to gold and another chance to try and get the title back. So, you know, it could not be any more personal. The only way this could have ended really is under these circumstances. Sheriff's rules and the loser retiring literally I, I believe it was Rick who said the company's not big enough for the both of us and I think that's true I think <laughs> if this hadn't have happened they just would have kept on and on each other until one of them was seriously injured and no longer able to wrestle anymore like you said they brawled all over the venue there was some brutal exchanges in this at one point Sheriff hit a spinning lariat and a boxman slam for a near fall which was a nice little call back to how he won the title because that's how he beat Marcus to win the heavyweight title a year earlier so that was a nice little nod you know they used tables Rick pulled out a moonsault which is not something he usually does so just showing how desperate he was that he would go to something that's not in his usual wheelhouse to try and beat the sheriff you know Rick got backdrop through the announcer's table he set up a couple of tables in the ring they both came off of the ladder and went crashing through it at which point because I think the ending as great as the match was and as personal and as heated it wasn't as much as the fans were into this because I mean that anniversary show there were so many matches that were so well built up and it's so hard to pick the best match from that show but this was one of the most anticipated matches we've ever had like say both men are down Grayson comes out to cheer on Steel and that gives him his second wind Steel gets a, a steel chair which again you know the steel chair has been heavily involved in their entire rivalry and has meant a lot to it and he's going to hit Marcus with it but instead Grayson gets in the ring and says you know I want my chance to get my revenge on Marcus what he did to me as well Steel obviously being a good friend hands over the chair everybody in attendance thinks oh, okay Grayson's going to crack Marcus with the chair Steel is going to win but no Grayson in probably the biggest betrayal in company history and that's saying a lot because there's been a fair few betrayals in the history of KOW swings the chair into his own tag team partner his supposed best friend Skull you can hear the shock in the crowd there's almost like a hush you know you can hear people sort of being like no and say no and just being confused and not sure what's happening and then once it sinks in the booze start to rain down on Grayson he repeatedly hits Sheriff with a steel chair and hits a pedigree leaves Steel's bad and broken buddy of Marcus who is just as confused as everyone else 
else. Marcus makes the cover, and that's it. Steele's career is done. He's been betrayed by his supposed best friend, his brother in Royal Justice. Marcus ultimately gets the win, but not even by his own hands, and he's forced to retire just to rub in, add insult to injury. Grayson gets on the mic and says that, you know, he said the sheriff says he loves him, but Grayson doesn't even like him, and that Steele's not even his own daughter's favorite wrestler, a reference to King Ryan Grayson being Sheriff Steele's daughter's favorite wrestler, and leaves. <laughs> um, so obviously, yeah heartbreaking moment and then yeah I mean afterwards Steele gets to reflect on his career talks about his successes with the fans and thanks them for all his support closes out by saying that KOW truly is the greatest show and says thank you I love you I'll miss you which again was another moment that watching back got me all emotional again the locker room empties out myself included to say goodbye and he gets a, a well deserved round of applause and the, and the due respect he deserved for several years of hard work for KOW you know putting his body on the line always standing up for justice and being somebody the fans could rely on but so much entertainment and so much laughter and joy to the company you know it's heartbreaking to see him go out like that but you know at least he got to say goodbye on his own terms he got to feel that love and admiration from all the fans of he had an incredible career third go briefcase winner former heavyweight champion tag champion basically helped create the tag team division was a dual champion which again only rick marcus can also claim to have achieved so yeah like we said previously i think we will probably see sheriff steel again at some point in the future but yeah in terms of in ring unfortunately he's done so a very very sweet match but Definitely for the brutality, for how personal it was, for how invested all the KOW fans were. This definitely deserved to be high up on the list. I know Sheriff Steele said on Twitter that he thinks it should have been number one, and I can respect that opinion. But yeah, 100% deserved a very high spot on the list. Oh, absolutely. And I think you're going to look back in all time KOW history, it's going to still be in the top 10. And you can clearly see what Sheriff Steele meant to the company, what he meant to Barrow, what he meant to Louis. I mean, it was definitely sad to see him go the way he did and obviously seeing what King Ryan Grayson did I mean that is definitely one of the bigger I think turns we've seen and even I think Rick Marcus the company in Alabama, I think was shocked himself when that happened I think obviously because we know that he had history with King Ryan Grayson so that was a very interesting match it obviously will definitely stand the test of time and that leaves us here for the best we've saved the best for last literally when it comes to the top 10 KO W matches in 2019 and I think at this point we should probably have named two bit the, the MVP the wrestler of the year of KOW because he appears on the top 10 or in the top 10 more than anybody else in KOW and you could clearly see why and he's destined for big things here and he's destined to make the top of the list here and he did against Lucas Neon and for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinary and we've saved the best for last Mr. ALP give us your take in a very very quick synopsis on the number one match of KOW of 2019, and that's Lucas Neon against the Gangster Lord, the King of Champs, literally the main event, Tubit. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, Tubit was 100% the MVP of 2019. He had six matches and four of them in the top 10, so that says everything you need to know. He main evented three shows. All of those are in the top 10, so yeah, absolutely, Tubit did a phenomenal job in 2019 and was probably the best performer in the entire company, so definitely bit to him despite his again his nefarious actions in the ring uh, he's still an incredible compare and does have incredible matches I mean this match you know I'd say if you haven't seen it go and watch it absolutely I'll talk about him all later but this out of all the matches uh, obviously do go and watch all of them but if you're only going to watch one this is the one to watch there's so much backstory here between the two you know Neon had previously had the rivalry with Mark Morellis which two bit was involved with the stretch for around a year so they already had a lot of animosity from that like I mentioned the underclass was formed that wanted and that cost Neon on the chance to win the showcase trophy this was set up after two big parts no dq match which was the number four match on the list and neon you know said they finally wanted a chance to get his revenge and win the title and set down the challenge for the tlc match in regards to it you can see as neon comes out he's incredibly pumped for the match at this point he's ascended to being the most popular wrestler on the roster and the fans are 100 percent behind him they're insanely loud for this match two bit sends decker and jacks to the back and walks to the ring alone again he's had a phenomenal year and he's the most despised man in the company so this match was really the perfect storm for me but the most loved guy in the company the most hated guy in the company massive backstory between for it it's a big stipulation TLC it's the main event I was ridiculously excited for this match and was really looking forward to it and 
super high expectations and it completely lived up to it the match itself you know it I wouldn't be able if we if I went through every great moment in the match we'd be here for ages but the two of them go at it exchange some brutal offense with the ladders one of the ladders nearly getting bent in half when two bits body gets thrown through it midway through the match two bit calls out the underclass and try and once again unfairly win the title but the freak show involved to back neon up they have a crazy big six-man brawl there's a massive tower of doom in the corner with all five of them decker and jacks get put through two tables simultaneously with drop kicks from the freak show the freak show hits some massive dives neon's tipped off a ladder onto everyone and then neon dives off himself finally the freak show drag decker and jacks to the back so that it's one-on-one neon gets his fair opportunity to try and beat two bit on his own terms two bit sets up as the ladder and again playing to the crowd it's like say it's one of his only weaknesses as he's climbing up the ladder he looks at the crowd and shouts that he's always going to be the champion he's going to be champion forever and that gives <laughs> neon the chance to fight back up he grabs two bits leg swings him out there's a table set up below them it's a gorgeous cut through the table off of the ladder gets the pinfall to one of the biggest reactions i've ever heard neon's his biggest strength which i think i mentioned previously is he's an incredible underdog you know if you look at his win and loss record it's not actually that great but that's part of what makes the fans love him so much is that he always keeps trying and keeps pushing the freak show come out to celebrate with lucas lucas's dad gets in the ring and gives him a big hug which was very emotional I mean, again as i've said a couple of times during the list i shed a tear at that it's a very sweet moment and the rest of his family get in the ring to celebrate with him as well which was again was a lovely moment he gets to celebrate his biggest win today with all his family who've supported him throughout the entire journey which was obviously lovely to see the fans give him a big you deserve it charm which he absolutely did at this point neon gets on the mic thanks his dad and credits him for getting him his start in kow and says you know there wouldn't be any lucas neon without him you know talks about how hard he won to win the title and yeah i mean it's one of the best matches we've ever had hands down it's an incredible match again the caps locks were a plenty when i was writing up the notes for this and i was <laughs> super into it in fact i had to actually watch it twice because the first time i watched it i just wanted to watch it and get invested and, and enjoy it as much as i could so i actually watched this match twice so that i could make some notes about it and one of the most heartwarming moments in kow history as well you know neon finally gets the big win everyone was so happy for him getting to celebrate with his family and yeah this match yeah if we had a top 10 matches ever in company history this would be up there and would be very very near the top both of the guys killed it the freak show and decker and jacks getting involved added some extra match and extra level of chaos and yeah the ultimate happy christmas time ending with uh, one of the most beloved guy in the company finally vanquishing the most despised guy in the company and capturing his, his first title so perfect they like, couldn't have asked for anything more from this match and it, it was great getting to watch it back and relive it all again ladies and gentlemen this is why you need to follow all the great things that kow is doing and what kow is going to do because a rising tide lifts all boats and we know that alp and many kow fans have felt down about the fact that we haven't gotten to be able to get back to normalcy and to be able to see our favorite wrestlers in the ring but we're almost there ladies and gentlemen and a rising tide lifts all boats and this is definitely going to wet and i think the palate of many 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 not just kow fans but professional wrestling fans because kow has put together a family friendly roster and a family friendly list here of the top 10 matches that i've said it and i'll continue to say it i'll put my money on kow against even companies like a pro wrestling magic because of the content the versatility and what this company has to offer him. this is why they call alp the heart and soul of kow and this is why we look forward to continuing to work with kow here on the sports report and on sportinarium to continue to showcase the many great things that this company has to offer him before i get your closing thoughts here and obviously it's always an honor to continue to talk about the great things that this company has to offer him we believe that the top 10 matches here in 2019 are definitely a small taste of what this company has to offer and what the future is in store for KOW. But I'm going to ask you, ALP, before I get your closing thoughts, I mean, what do you want to say to the KOW fans? What do you want to say even to the fans that are now just getting into KOW or the worldwide audience that is just learning of what KOW has to offer? I mean, what do you want to say and what the future might have in store for this company? So yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say is obviously a big thank you to everybody for all their support over the years. Obviously, the fans are the reason that we run shows and put so much work and effort into it is because we love getting those reactions from the fans and knowing that people are enjoying it and invested in the stories and the characters obviously if you're new uh, thanks for 
for checking us out and you know expressing some interest and hopefully watching some of these great matches that we've talked about and hopefully we will see you at club nine in the future when we are able to run shows again we are still tentatively hoping that we could run a show in september but we're still monitoring everything and we to see what's going to happen obviously the vaccines rolling out over here and that sort of thing and things are starting to open up again so hopefully september is when we will be back you know we're tentatively looking at things i'm tentatively looking at putting some matches together and stuff but again you know we're just waiting and see what happens so we're hoping that maybe by july time maybe yeah probably july i would imagine that is when we'll hopefully be able to make a definite decision so obviously you know follow us on all the socials i'm sure i'll plug a little bit shortly so keep an eye on that and what we're going to be doing of course you know all our titles are going to be defended you know the reign champions craig collins the heavyweight champion lucas neon the showcase champion and the free show the tag champions all the titles are going to be on the line i don't really want to go into more than that at the moment because I, I don't like making promises i can't keep <laughs> but you know as far as we're aware you know all the usual faces are going to be there there might be a couple of new faces you never know but yeah we're very excited you know, going through this whole process has got us all pumped up for it i know all the lads are going to be super 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 hyped up for this show you know they're going to be giving it that absolute all the emotions are going to be high the passion that's always been there is going to be there but it's going to be even more amplified after so long away so yeah i mean if you're in the barrow area or in the northwest uk or even if you do feel like traveling from further afield i'd definitely consider it you know our ticket prices are very reasonable it's, it's a very welcoming and friendly atmosphere and you know it's a fantastic show as far as i'm concerned and as many other people have told me so yeah thanks for all your support thanks for checking us out thanks for supporting obviously sport and Arium as well because we've obviously struck up a, a good relationship with you guys and we like to see that you guys are doing well as as well but yeah a big thank you to everybody obviously for all the support over the years the fact that we're coming up to nine years now of running events is obviously pretty insane you know we've had lots of successes lots of great moments and we're looking forward to just getting back to that and um, presenting more great stories but yeah a big thank you to everybody and we're hoping that we will see you all at cloud nine in september and there'll be an amazing night and it'll feel like we've never been gone and you guys haven't been gone and this list is an example why you guys haven't been gone and i'm glad you didn't make any promises because we know that mr decker has a lot of time on his hands these days and he probably is listening to this mm -hmm. and we know that a last week show he even talked about he wanted a match with sheriff steel we even talked about wrestlemania 38 main event sheriff steel and andre decker and he said if the zeros are right he wants to make that match happen so i realized that mr steel might be retired but i do know that mr steel heard what mr decker had to say so we know that mr steel is no longer able to wrestle in kow if mr decker is having his own problems in another wrestling company so who knows what the future brings we know that sportinarium is definitely in the promoting business these days and we're involved in promoting a boxing fight coming up here on september the 4th the battle on the beach here in brighton so who knows what is out there to offer who knows what sport and area could be playing in terms of roles with places like i don't know kow so we'll certainly see what happens but for you my friend it is a tremendous honor to be able to speak with you once again i want to give you the floor i want to give you another closing thoughts i also want you to plug all of your social media i also most importantly want you to plug all of our kow social media so we can keep up to date with all the great things that this company has to offer and i want to give you the floor i can't thank you enough and fire away okay so yeah thanks very much again tom uh, first of all a couple of uh exclusive announcements for you so obviously we've been posting the top 10 matches obviously we've talked about them here and this saturday so this will be tomorrow when you're listening to this 7 p.m uk time i'm going to be on will carter's twitch channel that's twitch.tv slash will lvs that's twitch.tv slash will lvs and we are going to be actually watching some of the matches from the top 10 matches of 2019 and talking about them live so it's going to be sort of a kow match watch along so i definitely suggest you come along and watch that you'll get to listen to me and will talk about the matches have some fun you know probably have a few laughs and it should hopefully be a, a fairly unique and interesting experience for people so definitely do come along and watch that and show will some love because we both do streaming as well and that'll be unique and something we haven't done before so definitely check that out the other thing i wanted to announce uh, exclusively here on the sports report is that we're not done posting matches and after you know the success of posting the top 10 matches of 2019 and how much fun it's been we're going to now start a series of the greatest kw matches of all time we've got a list together a short list of matches work's going to be side on them very soon it's going to be over the entire history of kow you know ridgeway and collins three minute iron man match some more recent stuff like two bit car and neon's triple threat match or five lots of stuff we've got about 10 15 matches already lined up so yeah keep an eye out because there's gonna be more matches going live from the entire history of kow some of the very best matches that we've ever put on so keep an eye out for those in terms of the socials my own personal ones you can find me AOP streams on facebook 
and on Twitter, because as I mentioned, I do stream as well, and I use those as my sort of personal accounts. Use my Twitter, my personal account as well, and also LP streams on Twitch. Knockout Wrestling on Facebook, K underscore Wrestling on Twitter, and K underscore underscore Wrestling on Instagram. Like I said, that's where the matches of the greatest KOW matches of all time will be posted, and that's where we will hopefully in the near future have news on our return event, match announcements, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, if you are interested, if something we've talked about today has piqued your interest, do obviously give us a follow on those. And like I say, all of the matches in the top 10 lists are available on Twitter and on the Facebook, so you can easily find them and watch them at your own convenience. Ladies and gentlemen, we got another scoop here on the Sports Report. They don't call us the number one global sports show for nothing. They don't call Sportinarium the number one global radio station for nothing, and you heard it first here. Tomorrow night, Will Carter, no stranger to this show, one half of the KOW Tag Team Champions, obviously as part of the Freak Show with Nightmare, along with our guests right now, ALP, the heart and soul of KOW, are going to be live streaming and giving commentary to some of those great KOW matches. So ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat when it comes to that. So everybody needs to know, needs to be able to go out and follow that and needs to find out why ALP and Will Carter are going to be talking all the latest happenings in the world of KOW. So we're very excited about that. We're looking forward to the next list and we can't wait to have you come back on in the next few weeks and talk more KOW because I think we're having a good time. I think everybody's having a good time. We're getting a lot of great feedback from obviously talking with you and some of the other talent in KOW. So we want to continue to keep that rolling and we want to continue to showcase all the great things that you guys are doing. So I want to congratulate you on this list. I know that the next work is about to take place and we know that Lucy's going to be out there and I want to give her a huge shout out. I can't thank her enough for all of her hard work and all the great things that she is doing because it is not easy. It does not take overnight to do this. So we know that Rome wasn't built in a day and Lucy's hard work is definitely paying off and we congratulate her. And for you, my friend, I'm looking forward to then talking with you again here in the next few weeks because I got a pretty good feeling there's going to be more KOW matches to go over. There'll be more KOW talent we'll be talking about and I'm sure that they'll have their thoughts on where they're placed and what better person to talk about all that is with you, my friend. And congratulations. I can't thank you enough and I'm looking forward to our next segment here in the coming weeks. Yeah, definitely, Tom. Thanks again for having me on. As always, it's a pleasure. Very excited to uh, come back in the future. It felt like ages since the last time we talked and obviously <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. So it's been nice coming back and doing it again. Like I say, hopefully, you know, this is going to be a, a regular thing where, you know, every few weeks we'll get to have a chat where it be about matches that have been released or just talking more about KOW and its history. And like you say, with some of the guys on our roster, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of talking points. Obviously, I had Andre Decker on and there's there's plenty we could have talked about from that. Uh, he's a very outspoken individual as well. Very um, so yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, yes. And as much as, as much as it's annoying, you have to respect him for it as well. No, he's a big man. No, listen, he's a big man, Mr. Decker. So I think he likes me. He seems to have a soft spot for me. So I will definitely want to keep on his good side, just like I want to keep on your good mm. side, because you are also a big man. I am looking forward to continuing to make this happen as a regular thing. So I'm looking forward to the next time and can't thank you enough. And congratulations on this list and looking forward to the stream here tomorrow night. Yeah, it's going to be great. It should be really fun. Hope everybody does come and join us on our world switch channel as we're here on the sports report the number one global sports show here on sporting area with the heart and soul of k that's booker and promoter and former general manager and also former ring announcer and that is a to talk the top 10 KOW matches of 2019, as I am America's greatest export, the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryson. Stay tuned for more professional wrestling talk here on the Sports Report as we talk with the assets, Stephen Cross, to talk the big ramifications of the Kenny Omega victory over Rich Swan and Impact Rebellion, as we were here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show with the heart and soul of KOW ALP to talk all the latest happenings in the world of KOW, including the 2019 top 10 KOW matches, as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Tom Bryce and stay tuned for more hard analysis here on Sport Area with the asset Stephen Cross to talk the Kenny Omega, Rich Swan outcome, and the fallout from that match here on Sport Area.